Because that's going to then fully open up this vision of DeFi and blockchain actually being something that benefits real people in the real world, right? That's coming with their real money, their real bank accounts, right? And they want to try to use DeFi and they don't want to jump through a million hurdles, right? That's what um, the synergy between centralized and decentralized stablecoins will actually bring us to. Hey guys, don't forget to check out our community app. It's the first not-for-profit app where you can predict, learn, and earn Bitcoin with zero risk. Test it out, especially if you're afraid of investing money, your own money. This is the perfect portal. Dear crypto community and blockchain blades across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonite's On The Road Special Edition Davos. And today we have an amazing guest who is here at the EA Partners Financial Summit. Great, great panels, great talks, and I'm honored to be with the CEO and co-founder of MakerDAO, Rune Christensen. A pleasure to have you, my friend. Thank you so much. Really glad to be here. You dropped so many like amazing pieces of information on the panel and I would love to just start by asking you about the story you kicked off with during the actual panel about how you got into Bitcoin back in 2011. If you don't mind like telling us that amazing story once more, that'd be great. Yeah, so I discovered Bitcoin in 2011 and I immediately went completely deep into the rabbit hole um, and I actually put all my money into Bitcoin and uh, that was great because I made a lot of returns right as the price went up and then I also lost it all again when the price crashed. And that experience of, of experiencing that volatility uh, was what drove me to realize that stable coins are what's necessary if you want to actually make blockchain technology and all the, of the advantages of Bitcoin um, you know, relevant and available for regular people and businesses in the real world. That's really interesting. So really your vision and mission was, you know, I just got hurt. I lost some wealth and, you know, I want to create a stable system to help with mass adoption. Is that kind of how you see your vision and mission of the... Yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? So that's really the fundamental goal of Maker is that we want to use the power of blockchain to actually create systems and value that benefits regular people. And I think especially the unbanked, right, and the disenfranchised that... Typically, from in technological revolutions of the past, they have essentially been left by the wayside. And blockchain really uniquely and inherently to the technology provides us this opportunity to actually create a, a technological revolution that actually, you know, primarily benefits the underserved and the people that have been disenfranchised from the financial system. So that's what we really want to push to the absolute limit and see how, how far can we take that and how much value can we create. And speaking of underserved, underprivileged, I know that you've seen many different countries acting very differently and you seem to be very passionate about a story you had in South America. Was it Argentina or? Yeah, that's right. So Argentina is one of the countries currently undergoing hyperinflation. Um, I believe that, um, I believe they currently have something like 50, 60% yearly inflation. Uh, it's constantly changing, of course. It's actually getting worse and worse right now. Um, and um, so Argentina has become, and especially Buenos Aires, has become the epicenter of organic dye adoption by completely regular people that don't understand crypto or care about blockchain, but simply are using dye as a means to escape hyperinflation and actually have a convenient way to hold, have exposure to the US dollar on their phones and even get access to the, um, the dye savings rate, so the inherent um, return you can get on holding dye in your wallet. And I think that's a really amazing story of how like this is the beginning of crypto actually being relevant in the real world. And does that make you those case studies or stories of people in Argentina? Is that really what makes you happy in the morning or make you wake up early and get ready to go to work? What are some other like specific milestones or achievements that make you really proud as, you know, the, the co-founder of such a huge DeFi movement? Yeah, I mean, there's Argentina and that case where I mean that's where we've seen the most success and I think that that's definitely I mean that's what it's all about for us right so that's what everyone in the in the, um, the maker team are really working towards but um, you know there's also the, the whole story of DeFi right and the emergence of this completely permissionless ecosystem of rapid innovation I mean so first of all it's just amazing that that 
our our fundamental idea that we would build die we would build this stable uh, you know bottom layer infrastructure and then we would promote for everyone else to build as many cool new innovations on top of it and that paid off right and we've seen all these DeFi projects um, but also that some of the coolest of these DeFi projects are coming from you know the places where you wouldn't necessarily expect it um, and for instance one project I really love to highlight is Instadap which is this uh, it's the fourth most um, popular DeFi project in the world based on, on uh, value locked on their platform and it was created by two teenagers with you know zero connections zero capital whatsoever uh, who built this platform from the ground up without even being in touch with us right so they just released it one day um, and what they also did is they really unlocked this one of the inherent like one of the fundamental powers of, of DeFi which is uh, this concept that's often summarized as uh, money Legos so this idea that DeFi and the inherent um, you know interoperability of blockchain and the permissionlessness of decentralized networks allows you to take existing building blocks out there so things like maker you know compound which is another popular DeFi project right and and stick them together and create completely new services by combining other projects together and that's what what um, Instadap invented so that's what these these um, uh, innovators out of India they they were the first one to really to do that at, and and uh, do it successfully with like a great user front end and uh, it paid off you know so they they're the fourth most popular project they were funded uh, with, with several million dollars from the top investors in the space and I think that's just the beginning of like a new wave of innovation that can emerge from anywhere right because all you need is the the idea and the skills to to code it and you can do it you don't need permission you don't need you know, you don't even really need to start capital. You just need the passion to actually go and build it. That's really cool. So that's one of the projects that you really like among this whole DeFi uh, movement. In terms of the asset class and the sub-asset classes, like we have lending, we have passive income, like what are some of the projects that you see are the most beneficial at the moment in terms of being in that DeFi asset class? Augur is definitely Augur. one of some of the, yeah. the sleeping giants that, that still hasn't reached its full potential. But I mean, I think it really shows, like it, it ha there's a lot of aspects of Augur that just have that real world benefit, right? And real potential because um, I mean, having these, these uh, decentralized and fundamentally, you know, neutral and unbiased uh, prediction markets, it just, it, it, it's just a, a benefit for the whole world, right? Because it's really powerful to have this kind of system that just works, right? And it's decentralized, can't be shut down, um, and it's available to everyone, right? And and one thing is that it allows people to, you know, to, you know, essentially gamble on, on predictions and all, you know, kind of like the consumer side of it. But it also just means that there is this source of information that's created by the blockchain, which I think is, is just very unique. And there's no upper house who's taking in all the profits. It's fair, it's trusted, and, and yeah. fun, right? Yeah. And fun as well. So Ogre, that's well. A lot of people are talking about lending platforms. And obviously, I would love to hear more about your angle on passive income and earn interest and why it's important. But do you also like this idea of lending platform in the DeFi ecosystem? Totally. I mean, I think that lending platforms are like the, that's the, that's the backbone of, of the DeFi ecosystem, right? I mean, you can, of course, you could, you could argue that Maker isn't really a lending platform. It's, it's slightly different. Um, and it's more like a, a monetary system, monetary system. Um, but it but it it still operates essentially very similar to a lending platform, right? In that there is one on one hand you have the people that that borrow from the system and deposit collateral, and then on the other hand you have the die holders who you know they access die because they want stability, but they also get that inherent um, die savings rate that sits at the protocol level and gives them that you know that minimum return that you're able to get in the DeFi ecosystem, and then. Because it's DeFi, there are so many options beyond that, right? So there's so many different things you can do. There, there are so many protocols, Compound, Fulcrum, DYDX. And, and that means that if your starting point is DAI and the DAI savings rate, which is the lowest risk that you can get in the space, you can then choose freely to, uh, you know, to change your, your risk appetite and go for, for instance, a higher return on a different platform that just, that just uh, has a different risk profile. 
That's really interesting. And speaking of risk, you know, a lot of the institutional players are more traditional, not exactly in the space. They're always worried about risk and they always want to be reassured. And they ask me like, you know, how does this work, this passive income and 6% for instance, and how do you reassure these people when they're like, oh, what's the risk or what's the catch? Like, how do you make their life easier and understanding that? Well, I mean, the thing about rates of return, right, and, and sort of interest rates more broadly is that, I mean, there never is a free lunch, right? So the fact that you can right now get 6% on the die savings rate, for instance, um, I mean, does reflect the fact that the die right now is primarily backed by ETH, right, which is a very experimental asset, right? So it certainly carries more risk than having money in the bank. But it's also a different kind of risk, right? So money in the bank, that's, that's counterparty risk, right? And that's like the risk of, of the system, right? Of the, the nation state. And I mean, as we've seen with the financial crisis, sometimes, uh, you know, there is actually more risk than you'd think in that kind of system, right? And that's where DAI um, provides diversification, right? So it's like a different type of risk. Um, and so that actually, um, like, sometimes that's enough to, to allow some of the more, uh, you know, innovative funds, for instance, to actually diversify into die because you know it's not about like again they don't they're not necessarily saying this is safer than dollars in the bank but they think of it as this is a is an alternative uh, you know risk profile and it allows me to get a nice rate of return so it's okay to to you know switch a small percentage of the portfolio into that so it's also like a philosophy, right? Like people there, so you're talking about diversification. So, okay, if you want to keep certain money in another centralized stable coin, but also a percentage of decentralized, is that how you see it? Like all actors working together rather than, you know, we're the decentralized movement, you're the centralized and, and fighting or? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what blockchain is all about, right? It's synergy. Um, and there is actually a tremendous synergy between decentralized stablecoins and centralized stablecoins specifically, right? Because, I mean, if you look at DAI today, one of the primary ways to um, get liquidity at, into DAI at scale is through USDC, so through the USDC stablecoins. And, and I mean, and as a, as a foundation, uh, we're very close with USDC, right? We really see them as like critical partners in providing that liquidity, providing that like, um, that, uh, I mean, also just something to measure DAI against, right? Um, and uh, as we go into the future, this synergy will, will actually fundament, like fundamentally change to a level where it becomes a lot more intertwined. Because, um, I mean, the latest release of Maker is the multi-collateral DAI system, right? Which is this, it is actually finally after five years, we've managed to complete the vision that we originally set out, right? Um, it's that complex, right? Five years. Yeah, I mean, that was... It, yeah, that was a much longer time frame than I originally expected back in the early days. But, and that's because of, of security issues, right? Like if you're gonna make a system that, is, that, that needs to be able to scale to billions or trillions, you have to you know, truly take a completely different approach to security than, than any other type of software or, or technology that's been built so far. With the exception of uh, something like airplanes, which is actually what like the you know, the security strategy of airplanes is actually what we uh, based how we made uh, the multi-collateral die system oh, secure. On. And, um, right, so, but so the point is that with multi-collateral die, we can finally enable more collateral assets in the system than just Ethereum. So first of all, that allows us to move away from uh, the paradigm where die is this like more, like more risky, but also like alternative asset that's more correlated with crypto. Um, if you look at it from a traditional perspective. Um, but in the short run, it also allows us to um, start onboarding other stable coins as collateral in the system. And for a lot of people, that's like, that seems a little strange because why would you, you know, like obviously DAI always has to be over collateralized, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why would you put in, you know, why would you put in $100 and use that to borrow 90 DAI or something, right? Like that doesn't make sense to a regular person, right? Like a normal user wouldn't do this. But there's a very critical type of user that will be doing this, and those are the market makers. So the people who provide the liquidity when you're trying to move into DAI, they, and, and today they are, they're somewhat struggling, right? I mean, that's one of the, the hurdles that DAI still needs to overcome, is the, the ability to provide large-scale liquidity from, uh, from, let's say, US dollars into DAI, or from, even more importantly, like uh, Argentine peso, for instance, right? I mean, that's, 
it, it's a big challenge to get that large scale liquidity and, and get into DAI. And if market makers start getting access to um, centralized stable coins as collateral in the system, that's going to completely change the game for them because it's going to allow them to actually use DeFi as a source of inventory management so that they could, for instance, take in several millions of dollars and um, instead of then immediately having to offload that to someone else in order to provide liquidity so that they can actually um, sell the die to you, they can simply you know, take your dollars and use those dollars to generate the die that in that instant they're going to sell to you and then later can't like close out the position on the other side, right? So they get this, you know, this the, the temporal aspect and sort of the, the challenge of sourcing the liquidity for DAI in that immediate moment when someone wants to do a big trade, that's going to be completely solved once we get into like large scale um, acceptance of um, centralized stable coins as collateral in Maker. So the, um, the bottom line is that over time, the liquidity profile of DAI will start approaching the liquidity profile of the centralized stablecoins. And that's going to be really exciting, right? Because that's going to then fully open up this vision of DeFi and blockchain actually being something that benefits real people in the real world, right? That's coming with their real money, their real bank accounts, right? And they want to try to use DeFi and they don't want to jump through a million hurdles, right? That's what um, the synergy between centralized and decentralized stablecoins will actually bring us to. So beautifully put, the best of both worlds, right? Really like synergy over competition or competition, as some people may say. I have to ask you, like t t today uh, during the panel, there was a really interesting debate on the CBDC, so central banks, digital currencies. Um, in terms of DAI as a stable coin, uh, let's, let's picture, let's say, for instance, the Chinese government decides to go for the digital RMB, the Chinese Yuan, or the U.S. with the digitized U.S. dollar. Um, is that good for us? What is your overall take on it? Because this tends to be like a, a big topic these days. Yeah, I think that is uh, extremely positive, right? Because it, it is just another proof point that the world is, you know, um, irrevocably moving towards blockchain becoming sort of the the, uh, the backbone and the fabric of the financial system, right? So that's just another, you know, um, step forward in that trend. And it's really critical to take these, like, I mean, these steps of like, let's say centralized stable coins, central bank digital currencies. I mean, it is crucial to allow people to, to choose those options if that's what they want, right? Because not everybody wants the same thing. And, um, and ultimately, the future isn't going to be a world where a single system ends up dominating everything. Because if that actually happened, I mean, we would have ended up achieving the opposite of what we actually wanted, right? Um, but I also think that um, the, uh, the, the proliferation of central bank digital currencies and just regular centralized stable coins um, does, um, you know, provide a very unique opportunity for Maker and DAI specifically because um, while we're seeing, you know, we're seeing so many centralized stable coins, right? And, and we're seeing so many central banks being, you know, typically the central banks themselves don't want to do it, but they're forced to by the governments. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're seeing so many of the, the central bank digital currencies also emerging. And, um, and that's because it's actually, from a technical perspective, it's actually quite easy to do, right? Um, whereas building a fully decentralized financial infrastructure like Maker, it's just so incredibly complex that, you know, it took us five years to do it. And we basically have the top people, like the top blockchain developers in the world working on this the whole time, right? Um, and, and also, I mean, the, there's this big element of trust, right? Where with a centralized stablecoin, you're really still falling back on that old pattern of like you're trusting, the, like you're trusting this bank to uh, take care of your money, right? And that's, that's how it works, right? So you're trusting this central bank or this other central bank or this commercial bank or this, you know, stablecoin issuer. And, and um, because there's this big element of trust and, and essentially brand as well, you always have this opportunity for new players to enter the space, right? Because they'll bring their own unique brand to the table, right? And their own trust with their unique user base. Um, whereas Maker doesn't really take this approach, right? Maker is completely neutral. Um, most of the people that will access it in the long run won't even really know or care that it's maker behind the scenes, right? It'll be some front end that presents it to them, right? And yeah. that's what they trust, right? Because that's again the, the neutrality and the decentralization of the system. And um, so I think the future will have so many different 
centralized stable coins, right? There will be hundreds of them, maybe even thousands of them. Um, and where we could, where we really see the opportunity for DAI in that universe is that, um, I mean, it comes down to this unique aspect of Maker and DAI being able to leverage the uh, the centralized stable coins for liquidity into DAI, right? So, like an easy way to 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 um, you know to move your money around will be yeah, well. You can go from this stablecoin, and because this stablecoin is accepted as collateral in Maker, it's very, very easy to move with a very, you know, very high liquidity and, and large-scale transactions into Dai. And then, because the same connection exists with all the other stablecoins, and hopefully as many as possible of the of the central bank digital currencies, um, I, I think that there's a there's a good possibility that Dai will become essentially like the, um, you know, the um, the central sort of of node in this giant spider web, right? So if you want to move from, let's say, USDC to the digital renminbi, or from the you know the Swedish stablecoin into some you know new I don't know African central bank digital currency or something like that, right? Then I think in many cases, because it's always some unique pathway that you want to move, right? Because every consumer and every user they have their own, like they've they've got their own thing that they want to do, right? Everyone's got different preferences. Um, in many cases, DAI will then be like the, the ideal way to, to make this transition through, right? So the market makers don't have to set up and try to actually provide liquidity for every single combination of which there will be, you know, like there will be tens of thousands, right? Of, of all these like different pairs against each other. And instead, by going through DAI, they will get this, um, you know, massive benefit in the form of, uh, of access to leverage and inventory management through the vault, like the, the maker platform and uh, the collateralized credit. Um, and just like the established liquidity that already exists, right? Because DAI is already there and there's already liquidity between DAI and USDC at the last year, right? And, and it's going to happen with all the other stable hunts as well. That's so interesting. So that, that's kind of the future that you want to see, that back end, that backbone that will have front end and people not even realizing they're using DAI, but it will support the entire DeFi ecosystem. Yeah, and, and what that will also achieve, right, is that, um, I mean, it's, it'll be a really beautiful, highly decentralized network, right? Because what it means is that once you're in one stablecoin, doesn't matter if it's the Renminbi stablecoin or if it's the Libra or USDC, you have such an easy access to any of the stablecoins that in essence, you can see the entire ecosystem as just one payments network. And that's going to be a game changer, right? Because that's the problem with the existing paradigm. That like, pay, like there are great payments networks all over the place, right? And they're super fast um, and they're, you know, they're cheap and they're very advanced, but they're always like uh, walled, right? They're always like walled off from each other and they try to kind of like keep the moat. They, they just don't really have a good way to interoperate with each other. And that's what the blockchain is going to change, right? And of course, what's also going to happen with the stablecoins is that a lot of the stablecoins will initially be forced to take the same approach. Yeah. And uh, especially the, the central bank digital currencies. In many cases, they will they will do the same thing, right? You you got something like the the JP Morgan stablecoin, right? Is an example of a of a stablecoin that's, you know, I mean. From, in my perspective, it's not even really a stable coin, right? I mean, it's sure it's a stable asset, but it's it's not really on a like it's not on a blockchain that's interoperable with the rest of the ecosystem. And oh, for that reason, it, it ends up being a different. It's a different type of mechanism, right? It looks a lot like it looks a lot more like the old world with some technical upgrades rather than the complete paradigm shift that this new, uh, you know, interoperable ecosystem of permissionless innovation that. That are like the you know the, what I would call the real stable coins like like USDC like um, like Dai right like many of the other stable coins that are coming and hopefully um, I sincerely hope that some of the central banks did you know central bank stable assets will also take this approach because they will understand that that's you know that's how they provide the value because that's the fundamental value of blockchain right it's this permissionless access to a shared economic network. That is fascinating, Runa. Amazing, amazing description. So if, if correct me if I'm wrong, please, because it's quite technical. So in terms of the stable coin, you would define it as not just something that's backed by something that's stable or that's stable in itself, but it has to also be interoperable on a decentralized ecosystem. Is that how you would define? Please correct me if... Uh... <laughs> I mean, that's how I would define a coin. A I coin. Guess, uh... right? I mean, there has to be that... Well, I mean, it... 
who knows how the semantics will play out over time, right? That once upon a time, uh, the term stablecoin only meant decentralized stablecoins. So that actually shifted, right? Because nowadays, a stable, like, so a central sta centralized stablecoin, back in the day when, like, when Tether was launched, nobody called Tether a stablecoin. They called it an IOU, right? That was the original name for, for a centralized stablecoin. Um, so who knows how that will play out over time, right? But, but I guess my point is that I believe that's where the, the impact and the paradigm shift will happen, right? It's with the stablecoins that do allow at least some element of permissionless innovation and interoperability, right? Because it is, it is the interoperability that is the core essence of, core of blockchain, essence. right? It's like uh, it's synergy. That's what blockchain is about. So would there be like two layers? Like even if there's a centralized coin, as long as it's on a decentralized network and working together and being interoperable, is that the ideal future you, you see for this space? Or I mean, that's I mean that's certainly what I would prefer to see. The uh, you know the next decades play out right is that we initially see all these central like these stable coins emerge sort of as, as um, relatively like fractioned um, ecosystems right um, and then maker ends up becoming the, um, the project that really focuses on just trying to connect the liquidity so because I mean maker has always been about um, building the infrastructure right and not really trying to build the, the something for the end user right like the goal is to allow others to build that on top of the, the ecosystem, right? And not, you know, pick favorites or pick winners or try to kind of like build the ultimate product that the users want, right? Because everyone wants something different. Yeah. And so that's why what we are focusing on is just trying to be available everywhere, right? And just, um, you know, removing any sort of barrier to entry and, and you know, just being as neutral and unbiased and, and accessible to everyone as we possibly can be. I love your growth mindset. It's not like you're completely on one side. You see opportunity, synergy everywhere. And speaking of which, that brings me back to something you were telling me earlier, quite funny, where you were saying that, oh, actually, uh, I was a Bitcoin maxi back in the day, but this happened and this happened. Um, how, how, how did you go from those two states? And because now you're so flexible and you're, you're really looking at creating an ecosystem that works all together. What happened in your life to, that made you change you know, suddenly like that? But you, you see all these institutions and all these like regular people and, and or, or like, you know, um, top investors, they all get into Bitcoin with a mindset that Bitcoin is like gold, right? It's this asset that you buy and sell based on your risk appetite and your, your desire to, to do kind of like a, a counter cyclical hedge, right? Not as kind of like, you know, this like ultimate solution to everything that it, those of us that got into Bitcoin in the early days in like 2011, that was really what we were envisioning with it, right? And instead, we, you know, I mean, and this is what I think has happened most in the entire space for the most part, right? We're transitioning to this, this paradigm of there's different solutions for different problems, right? With stable coins, um, I mean, I would, I would uh, really say is one of these, I mean, is like the core thing that ties it all together, right? The stable coins will be the fundamental way that kind of like all the other like DeFi and the various crypto assets and Bitcoin and so on, like all will tie into a single, you know, coherent economic system for the world that allows everyone, right? And once again, this is what it's all about, right? Allows the unbanked, the disenfranchised people who right now are simply being, um, you know, biased against by the existing system. And they will also get access to this new paradigm, right? And they will actually benefit more than everyone else. And that's, that's what's going to be so amazing, I think. That's going to be so amazing. And in terms of like what we need, what are the roadblocks we still have ahead in order to reach that? We, we call this show Kryptonite. So uh, if DeFi was Superman, what would be the DeFi Kryptonite of today? Really like problems that you really want to solve like in the upcoming year or even few years? Yeah. 